today, Dr. Blackler will share with us his thoughts on the prehistory of the Portland chart. Dr. Blackler. So, uh, let me first say, so this, uh, the present paper uh, takes a new approach rather than focusing. Uh, I seem to have, okay, okay. Uh, so rather than focusing on a surviving chart necessarily restricted to the 13th century, it investigates the historical context of the period immediately before, that between the 8th and 12th centuries, and any non-cartographic evidence that may provide indications of its genesis. Certain of these are at the limits of my own specialism, but I believe their inclusion is necessary to provide a comprehensive picture Excuse of me, the historical Andrew. and scientific background. Excuse me, Andrew, only half of your chart yeah. is up on a couple of our... Uh, screens i'm wondering uh i know some of us are having... oh, okay wait a minute let me let me try and put it up like this is that okay now for you yeah sure that's very good thank you that'll work okay perfect so our first task is to answer two questions neither of which is uh, soluble in any absolute way what are the defining features which distinguish the Portland chart from other sea charts or earlier maps? And assuming that the Carte Pizan is not the first Portland chart, when was the first chart produced? Before this, however, we must address the basic problem of all historical research into this period, the very low survival rates of the sources prior to the 12th century. We work on official papers from Mount Athos, a monastic enclave in northern Greece, has shown that whilst 50% have survived from the 14th century, this falls to only 3% in the 10th century. Adjusting for survival rates are statistical indication of the earliest Portland chart, thus suggests the 11th century, a proposal that uh, Richard Oldham had made nearly a century ago. The key features have been discussed in some detail by Tony Campbell in his 1987 essay. Most are accepted by all, but for today's purposes, I will only comment on the last two. My first observation is that we have assumed that marine use means by the merchant marine. Yet in this period, international commercial law had not developed sufficiently that merchants could operate independently of emperors, caliphs, and the state. In fact, in Genoa and Venice, the merchants were the state, something that provided them with a key competitive advantage. Often commercial agreements were made following or to support military action. A good example is that made in 1082 between Venice and the Byzantine emperor, Alexios Komnenos, which opened up Byzantine ports to Venetian merchants in return for military support against the Normans of Sicily. The history of science in this period, even more so than the study of the Portland chart, is very much in its infancy. It suffers on the one hand from a lack of edited editions of many of the Arab sources, and until recently comprehensive gazetteers of surviving instruments, and on the other from a lack of understanding of the method of transmission of technology. Transcultural studies over the last century have tended to focus on the process of translation, but recent work has looked at an array of objects, emphasizing how the transfer from east to west occurred much earlier than their first mention in the written record. Thus, setting the origin of the Portland chart by the date of the first written mention of the compass may be an erroneous methodology. Take, for instance, the astrolabe, an instrument of astronomical measurement that dates back into antiquity. Work by Marcel de Tourme and more recently David King, although subject to dispute, has demonstrated that the earliest one made in Western Europe is probably from Catalonia and dated to the 10th century. But its use was not only academic. For the Muslim world, the instrument was of fundamental religious importance. Using complex mathematical tables developed in the 9th and 10th centuries to define location, it was possible with an astrolabe 
to calculate the Qibla, the orientation of a mosque and direction of daily prayers towards Mecca, thus making high-level mathematics a part of everyday Islamic life. But technology transfer in the medieval period was also of a more practical and brutal nature. In 1147, for example, Roger II of Sicily invaded central Greece, captured over a thousand silk workers, then the industry leader in the manufacture of high quality silk, and transported them back to Sicily. The glass industry provides another in instance, apart from the importation from the Levant by Venetian merchants of broken glass or cattle as ballast from as early as the 10th century. By 1271, the city was encouraging foreign artisans to relocate whilst protecting its own glass industry against competitors by prohibiting their departure to other cities. In a cartographic context, we must therefore look more closely at the origins of the artisans working in this sphere. Pietro Vesconti was a Genoese working in Venice. Ali Drizi, recruited to the Sicilian court, was born in Ciota and studied in Cordoba whilst many cartographers were of Jewish origin. In 12th and 13th century Christian Toledo, Jews also were often the intermediaries for translation of Arabic texts into Latin. Proposals have been made that there was some form of direct transmission of Ptolemy's Geographia into the Portal and Chart an Arabic translation made by Abu Yusuf al-Kindi in 866 on a book of al-Khwarizmi, who clearly had access to a world map, suggests that knowledge of the work did not disappear following Arab annexation of Alexandria in 641. Indeed, the book, and especially its sister publication, the Almagest, are much quoted by later Arab authors. Unfortunately, although many large libraries were established in the Iberian Peninsula in the 9th and 10th centuries, no manuscript of the Geographia has survived from during the period of Easternization of the culture of Al Andalus. In the 11th century, both Al Biruni and Al Bakri, working in the Iberian Peninsula, make several citations of Ptolemy. And we are only now realizing that much scientific research of the Eastern Islamic world. Uh, never reached the West. The Arab world thus had the technical capability to map their domains. Judging by the work of al Idrisi and the 11th century Book of Curiosities, their geographical knowledge was also extensive. As yet, however, we can only await the transcription of new Arabic texts that may provide a greater insight into the development of Islamic science and cartography. Indications of a possible process of transmission of the geographica or the development of other forms of sea chart can, however, be identified by studying the built environment of the medieval period. Towers are a prominent landmark in many portal land charts. They were once a ubiquitous feature of the coastal landscape around the medieval Mediterranean. For example, on this Visconti chart, we see the use of the Italian Ture twice on Negroponte, an island just off the eastern seaboard of Greece. They can also be identified by toponyms, such as the Latin Vigla. In the Arabic sources, they are referred to as Ribat or Mehrasa or Atalia in the Iberian Peninsula. In Greece, the term Pirgari still witnesses their prior existence even on 20th century maps. Most had a role simply as a localized watchtower providing protection against sudden corsair attack, both Arab and Christian, but many were part of extensive communication systems. We have documentary evidence in the 9th century of beacons designed by a man we know as Leo the Mathematician, stretching from the southern Byzantine borders in modern-day Syria, 700 kilometers to Constantinople. Another chain stretched over 4,000 kilometers along the North African coast, linking the Arab world from Ceuta in Morocco to Alexandria in Egypt. Archaeological evidence 
has been identified of early networks in Greece, on the island of Sicily, and in the Iberian Peninsula on the Arab Catalan border. All of these networks, and they seem to have existed throughout the Mediterranean, were major military investments by organized states, and they needed good technical surveying to minimize the number of nodes and operating expense whilst maximizing visibility, a highly complex problem. The astrolabe, oh, the astrolabe could be applied to this work, as in the orientation of the Muslim mosque noted above, although the exact process I'm not qualified to comment on. The above observation suggests that we should look at the role of the state, often in war the catalyst for innovation. The Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire, for instance, possessed a sophisticated military technology at this date, both practical and theoretical. Over 250 treaties on tactics and strategy are known to have existed, covering both continental and naval operations. In the ninth century, here I am superimposing the Byzantine Emperor over a modern map to give better points of reference. Arab forces, triumphant in the Middle East and North Africa, were still on the offensive. In 827, they had attacked Sicily, and by 836, naval commands called Themata had been set up stretching from southern Turkey through Greece to Sicily. No charts have survived from this period, but an analysis of the so-called Ravenna cosmography of around 700 indicates the continuing use of maps in Byzantine Italy at this day. Evidence of their existence is also provided by the historian Anna Komnana. She describes how a map, presumably of the Albanian and Italian coasts, was dispatched by the emperor to aid his local commander in the Byzantine campaign of the against the Normans of Sicily. But even a naval commander in the field did not have automatic access to a map of his area of operations, suggesting data amidst clear concerns that it might fall into the hands of the enemy. Let us now turn to the wider process of technology transfer. The Mediterranean Basin in this period appears to be much more integrated than many historians once accepted, even across religious lines, with diverse relationships and alliances. For instance, the 10th century Andalusian Caliph, Abd al-Rahman, despite Christian Muslim antagonism, was even loaned a translator by the Byzantine emperor for a new translation of a Greek medical text. We also need to remember that following the reconquest by Christian forces of the city of Toledo in 1085, the translation into Latin of Arab and Greek medical, philosophical and mathematical texts continued unabated. Ongoing academic and commercial contact existed throughout the period between Byzantium and Arab Baghdad and Italy and North Africa, despite their political enmities. In the West, too, until 1229 and the recapture of the Balearics from the Arabs by James I, the Catalans were still very much reliant on Pisum and Genoese sea power. In a similar vein, in 1082, we unexpectedly find the Byzantines dependent on Venetian naval assistance to withstand the emerging power of Northern Sicily. Yet, for the Byzantines, this was nothing new. Unlike Western states, their military power and success over the previous two centuries had been based on the exploitation of a professional army and navy. In 968, Leoprand of Cremona who had traveled to Constantinople to arrange a marriage between the emperor's daughter and the son of Otto the Great of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, showing another form of linkage in this period. Uh, Lupin noted the inclusion of 
Latin ships in the Byzantine naval forces. We have a mention, for instance, of two Genoese brothers recruited into the fleet, but examples abound of Western Europeans rising to senior military positions in the 11th century. We can therefore understand exactly how Byzantine sea charts might have come into the hands of the Genoese, Venetians, and Catalans. Confirmation of the existence of local Byzantine maps prior to the development of the borderland chart also emerges from recent mathematical analysis of the borderland charts themselves. Joachim Gaspar, by comparing the directions given in the Liber de Existencia with actual bearings, has demonstrated that those around Italy correlate with the use of com compass bearings, whilst those from further afield, the Eastern Byzantine and Western Catalan Mediterranean indicate traditional astronomical methods. Raoul Nicolai, using geodesic methods, has confirmed the supposition of Tony Campbell that the Portland chart was constructed from smaller regional charts. We can put these analyses into some historical context. The Mauve region encompasses the trading extent in the Western Mediterranean of Genoa and Pisa, with their close links to the Catalans. And then after 1229, the probable development of Portland charts on the Balearics. The central yellow grouping appears simply a reflection of the immediate Venetian trading area in the Adriatic, restricted up the Western Italian coast by its competition with Amalfi, Pisa, and Genoa. The third red region is much larger, and when added to that of the Basi, there's a close remembrance 600. Recent work by Libriatos and Butura has shown that the most accurate coastal sectors on the Carte Mozan are, in the main, those once under Byzantine control. I would argue that this reflects an early evolution of sea charts, possibly away from a basic Ptolemaic model. Hello, did I lose you just there? I, I seem to yes. have uh, fallen out. Uh, up until which bit did you see? Did you see the last? Uh... We saw the slide with Roel Nikolai's. Uh, um... oh, okay. Region. All right. So uh, I am sharing my screen again. Sorry about that. Let me just uh, share my screen again. So. Uh, Recent work by Liveriatos and Bultura has shown that the most accurate coastal sectors on the Carte Pizan are in the main those once under Byzantine control. I would argue that this reflects an early evolution of sea charts, possibly away from a basic Ptolemaic model following the creation of Byzantine naval commands in the late 7th and early 8th centuries. Superimposing the empire's extent at the end of the 9th century, it is as though a medieval Maginot line has been created. Such information for good military reasons never became generally well known. The 1082 treaty signed between Venice and Byzantine is so detailed, however, listing 32 ports, that the Venetians must already have possessed some form of chart by this date. Thirteen years later, in 1095, the Genoese provided transport for the first crusade to the Holy Land. Again, the sheer size of this endeavor and the long distances involved could not have been achieved without some form of chart. There thus probably existed by the end of the 11th century a complete understanding of the geography of the Mediterranean in some cartographic form. I would like to leave you with five key points. 
firstly, I hope I have demonstrated that the technology of the medieval period was more than capable of producing accurate sea charts, although I suggest most likely from fixed land-based beacon point, key role that the state has played in so many new technological developments. The sea chart was probably a key strategic weapon in the arsenal of the Byzantine military. As to its dissemination, this probably occurred primarily through the service of Latin mercenaries in the Byzantine navy, although I believe that we may have underestimated the part played by the Jewish diaspora. Finally, there is a need to understand the source of the accuracy of the Moroccan and Algerian coast, and whether there is an as yet unidentified Muslim cartographic tradition. In conclusion, I hope I have succeeded in putting the genesis of the Portland chart into an historical context. I fear, however, that the origin question is considerably more complex uh, and messy than research to date has presumed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Everett. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll open the floor for yeah. questions. Sorry about my uh, connection. Oh, that's, that's quite all right. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? There's a, um, where is it, under reactions button is where you can click raise hand like I have just done. So my, Mike, uh, I have a, a question then. Uh, so the, um, you're proposing the, the Byzantine sea charts preceded the use of a marine compass? That's a question. Uh, yes, I am. I am presuming that they were created using uh, as, astronomical uh, basis. Yeah, and then later the compass was applied uh, in in the development or evolving of uh, portland charts from these Byzantine sea charts. That Correct. A... I am essentially expanding Gaspar's uh, yeah. thesis. Uh, yeah. that the uh, compass uh, directions were only covering the Italian coast, in essence. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, Tony, you have a question? On mute. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, th thank you very much indeed for that sort of stimulating uh, uh, talk. Um, uh, I, I think probably you would expect me to, to, to want to say something about it. I, I, I'm not sure how widely... Um, appreciated that I, I published a very long essay on the origins of the charts uh, back in January, completed as a result of the, of the um, pandemic. Um, and- uh, oh, No, I didn't know about that. Okay, but it, it, it's, avail it's available free on my website, um, mm -hmm. that, the map history website in, in, in the, among the various other uh, portal essays, some by, some by some, some distance it's the longest of them. Um, I mean, I'm not going to um, reprise anything of that. It, it's as I said, it is available freely, so anybody can have a look. Um, but uh, I think one of the major points that, that I make there is that um, it is, is to refer to uh, the Idrisi's um, uh, large, uh, very large uh, world map of uh, 17, oh dear, 1750, 50 odd, I've forgotten. <laughs> um, and, uh, the fact that it, there, there is no trace of the Portland chart in that whatsoever, and indeed, mm -hmm. he talked, uh, well, he must have talked to, but had he and and uh, uh, and the king uh, had they actually listened to the sailors, they would not have come up with the kind of outlines that are that are there, which um, everybody who is sailing around Italy and so on would, would know perfectly well what the shape is and, and how it how it, it, it fits into the the, the Adriatic. And the fact that there's no trace of that at all um, led me to actually um, claim that therefore the Portland chart was not in, in, in existence at that time. Now, that is a dangerous argument to, to, uh, to work back from, from, from absence. But they, they did spend 15 years placed in, in a strategic position in Palermo and Sicily and act, actively um, collecting information from uh, travelers and, and so on and so forth, anybody that basically that they could find. And if had any sailor had possessed a Portland chart and had shown it to, uh, to uh, Drizzy and the king and said, look, you know, this is how it is, then they would almost, I mean, I think they would certainly have taken note of it. And quite clearly they didn't. So I, I, think, um, I think I'm on fairly strong grounds there in saying that there was no Portland chart 
uh, known in, in the um, uh, Islamic world it, it, at, 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 at the middle of the 12th century. And um, uh, Yossi Rappaport, I think, would support me on that. Well, so, I think I would, I would agree with that. I'm really arguing that there are subcharts that are uh, being incorporated into the Borderland Chart at, at a later date uh, that are coming from various directions. Um, so one is the Byzantine side. I'm not saying, you know, there may be three or four different small Byzantine charts which were being incorporated into that, and that came to the root. Um, from the other side, we have to look at the Catalan side, where, uh, how should I say, uh, Liveriatos has uh, found great accuracy along the coastlines. So one has to ask, where does that come from? Uh, and I think that they, they, it's, a, it's a process of maybe two or 300 years uh, before the borderland chart was actually created. So I don't necessarily disagree with a 13th century origin for the borderland chart. I'm just arguing for the various uh, different routes uh, to get to that. Uh, Emmanuel, you had a question also. You'll have to. Yes, do you that. hear me? Okay. Yes, 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 I hear you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this broad remembering of the importance of the Byzantine Empire at this time. But what are your sources to say that it may have used Portland charts first? No, no, no. no. Ah, now I'm not saying they used Portland charts. Uh, okay. I'm saying they had developed some form of sea map. Uh, that is. Do you the, know that? Hmm? Sorry. I I didn't well, understand we, how you are, you come to this conclusion. What, we, what are your thoughts? Well, we know that because, well, first of all, we have a reference by Anna Komnena in her yes. history uh, of uh, the use of a sea chart or map uh, in the Sicilian campaign or the campaign against the Sicilians in the early 12th century. So... Uh, a map did exist uh, of that sea area because he was actually providing, the emperor was providing a map to his uh, commander in the field who was having problems trying to prevent the Sicilians landing. You have the exact quote of this uh, uh, passage? Yes, I don't have the exact quote here, but I can provide it to you if you want. Uh, that, that's, it's it's uh, within the histories and it's it's well uh, documented. Well, and so they may have had some sorts of maps, but um, it, it has no um, relation with the Portland cast, which is a very specific kind of uh, maps. It's not yeah, easy but, maps, but the... it's not Ptolemaic maps, it's a very, very uh, specific kind of map. So, yeah, the, uh, why do you think chart, it's originated in Byzantine Empire? Uh, no, I am not saying, again, that the Borderland chart originated in the Byzantine period. I am saying that the Borderland chart was taking data from Byzantine sea charts that had existed for three or four hundred years before. So, uh, that, that's, I think, what uh, we are seeing from the accuracy of the, uh, the first carte design, which uh, comes in, which is showing that the highly accurate areas are from within the Byzantine Empire. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, okay. Our, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Our, our next speaker is uh, Jacques Nil, and he's a retired professor of history in geography and economic and social sciences. And uh, his most uh, recent work, publication in the history of cartography is the book, The Avignon Map, the first study of the Avignon nautical chart of the beginning of the 13th century, which is the subject of Dr. Mill's uh, presentation today. Uh, Dr. Mill. Very good. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and glad to meet you. Three years ago, 
I had made in the second workshop in Lisbon a talk about a nautical chart recently discovered in the archive of Avignon, La Carta d'Avignon. I had suggested a dating at the beginning of the 14th century, and uh, the chart was uh, the oldest, could be the oldest, old, one of the oldest, after Pisan and Cortona the third, before Wisconsin's chart and Carignano's and Dorcia's was. I also proposed the hypothesis that the chart could be the first to have made a mapping of the northern regions beyond Bruges towards Denmark and Baltic Sea up to the Coraline. But there are no consensus about that proposal and it remained in many a uh, handful of questions. Since I have deepened my research in the chat conclusions, which confirm the dating and the drawing of the northern regions up to Scotland on one hand and to Gotland in the Baltic in the, on the other. From this research, I have self-published a book in May 2021, La Carte d'Avignon. For the present talk, I have took up data in this research to explain that charts is well, well prevescount and how can be solved the major problem of the chart. It has the mapping of the course beyond Bruges to the, up to Gotland. Now you may see the diaporama. Okay, the next one. Here you may see you may see the whole chart. It shows only the Western Mediterranean, eastern part with the Black Sea being lost, and northern regions. We see a double red circle decentered far towards to the south to make place on the vellum in the north. And also a strong shift of 45 degrees to southwest, more than on the other chart of the time. We see also wind lines in a double circle in four grids, Adriatic Sea, sector of Gibraltar, Brittany, and North Sea. Uh, Jacques, also, I have to interrupt. Uh, you're not screen sharing. We're only looking at your uh, file manager, not the uh, presentation. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Next one. Yes. yes. Uh, the first page, the second page with uh, with uh, the chart, and then my own. Uh, all, uh, also, you may see uh, a scape circle you know, on the on the chart, and uh, maybe a declination, magnetic declination of eight degrees, perhaps uh, for use of the compass. For the, from this feature, the chart appears to be close to Pisan and Cortona, but it presents difference with Wescon charts, coastline, sea hazards, and little black cross, red on Wescon, toponyms. Close to other charts of the time, it used a common base chart, chart base for Mediterranean, but draws original an original mapping for all extra Mediterranean areas, Atlantic and North. Next. Here, the chart presents enig uh, many enigmas. Seven chairs, a curious drawing of the northern coast beyond Bruges, far toward to the north, along a named river flowing far towards the east, many thought could be the Elbe, a huge shower with 24 colored pedals, which is an unicum on nautical chart, an island named Yolander, which is an apex. A sign in gray in the scale circle and unknown toponyms as Irlanda, Sarnen, Paradi, and undecipherable writings in the corner down of the chart. Next. Here you have a the first representation of an ice in the Grand Canal at the, in the top of the Adriatic, the Adriatic Sea. The grid of the Adriatic is a proof of an insufficient knowledge of that sea by the child maker probably walking in Liguria. Perhaps Genoese, but so many proofs, the chart does not show any link with Wisconsin and its workshop. Toponings, drawing of the coast, semiology are different. Hence, 
certainty of the independence of the chart marker and the use of own Ligurian sources for mariners or merchants. And also certainly he used that own data obtained in Bruges or London from Anseatic mariners or merchants. Here with the Atlantic coast of France, we may see the drawing of a bit is better than Pisan, but lesser than Vescon. Um, maybe the, the Recordana, 1310, probably. And we have the first representation of Brittany, as well as the first one of this island in color. That is due to the improvement of the knowledge of the Atlantic up to England and Bruges, due to the growth of voyage uh, by Ligurians for trade, as well Genoese called by Philippe Lebel to build up a fleet, Claude de Galais, Rouen, and their presence in Bruges during the French occupation and London and English port. In the great grid of the North Sea, we have an attempt by the chart marker to map the coast of Northern regions. We were known, but not mapped until now. Then we see the English coast well oriented and Coast Bay and Bruges curiously oriented south north and very long. In fact, a drawing without any equivalence on the chart of the time. The major, in fact, the major problem of the chart. But nevertheless, we have some sure marks with certain toponyms, others very probable and others absolutely new and sometimes unknown. All the place named Bayon Bruges are in first notation, 25, 30 years before their appearance, appearance on the Carignanos on, and the Dulcet charts. And in England, the most of place, place names are original and not shared, shared with those of Wisconsin and more numerous. A focus on the Anglo-Scottish Scots from Dover to the Scottish first, beyond the Tweed. A drawing of a strict English exactness with no contest, very better than the Vescon's chart. And the possibility of a circumnavigation due to the drawing of the Bristol Channel and the Severn uh, on the west coast. Here a drawing, a drawing which differs of the Vescon's and Dutchess charts, really older and by a chart marker working with all his own sources. Here we have the major problem of the chart with the drawing of the coast, we must explain. In fact, the drawing we cannot understand only if we have in mind the difficulty encountered by the chart maker to orient correctly this coast towards the east from Friesland because there is to hide off sight all the central and eastern Europa. Later, Carignano and Dulcet will be facing the same problem, and we know how they solved it. The first with a very long belting and narrowing central and eastern Europa, Europa. The second with a very wrong drawing of the Baltic, but nevertheless becoming the canonical model of all maps following during two centuries. And of course, the length of this course were a problem for the chart marker. Hence, the solutions, right? To read them correctly from Friesland, we must tilt nine, by 19 degrees the drawing to give them the good orientation and shown as shown on the following figure. With the correct orientation, we recognize this coast with a schematized drawing, but in conformity with the reality. A drawing made by the child marker from our reports and describing the coast in the main lines and good order for features, estuaries, headland of Denmark, Danish belt shown with a different form than the estuaries and place names. Hence, the toponym of Sarnen may be read as Canor, a very important and well known port and market for the fishing of herrings, noted some years later on Mapa Mondi of Poland de Venise. And then it appears. The long unnamed river cannot be held because first, it's bad placement east of Lübeck. 
Second, the, it's good west placement west of Denmark. Maybe the order. To complete, a look on the Flemish, Dutch, and Frisian coast shows a good succession of the mouths of the Esco, Mers, Rhine, and Zuiderzee. Also, the Frisian archipelago schematized in red with the Wadden Sea. And we must note the, the writing of Bruges in Norwa, Breye, as a good proof of, of an Anseatic source. For the churches, a curiosity of the chart, they seem to be pilgrimage centers. Cologne, Bruges, or Swiss, Munster, perhaps an indication for a link with a clerk or a monk. Here is a figure in my book to show the correspondence of the drawing of the coast on the chart and the reality. All the estuaries are drawn in correspondence with those of Escomers, branches of Rhine, Zuderze, up to Friesland. Beyond, we we'll recognize, schematized in red, the Frisian archipelago, the Dollart and Ems, the Gulf of Jad in Bremen, the Martian of Actuat Gestland and the Elbe. Cologne, Muster and Magdeburg inland are noted in directional position. In my recherches, Christmas 2019 brought me a marvelous gift, the discovery of Gotland. In fact, since the first study of the chart, I often thought the mysterious island Irlander could be Gotland, but it missed the absolute proof. Not worth it with this drawing. The comparison of the drawing of the chart and the reality does not make any doubt for me. No, not a mere coincidence with such an exactness drawing. And we can think we are really in presence of the drawing of the island of Gotland. And then, if so, all was in coherence in my conclusions. And I could confirm first the coast drawn beyond Bruges are well those of the North Sea, Denmark, and southern ones of the Baltic. Second, the long unnamed river, not the Helm, but rather Oder or Vistula. As, as, and as to reinforce, reinforce my views, the 1339 chart of Dulcet comes to my rescue with the gloss of Leo Vif, which makes him like the role of Gotland as a hub of trade between Bruges and the Black Sea. And the longer name and river strongly drawn since then, a synthesis of all the rivers Oder, Vistula, Niemen, Vina, Narva with Novgorod, which give access through Poland, Russia, Ukraine, to Genoa trading place of the Black Sea, Kaffa and Tana. These trading routes are well known in story with the metropolis of Gotland and the role of the hands, which had at, the, at this time the control of the navigation beyond Bruges, before the ban made to the Mediterranean ships to go further in 13 73. End to end, another figure of my book to show the Schaffmacher was a professional expert in mastering the techniques of his time, as well being able to innovate, hence resorting to a common form for the drawing of Mediterranean, sharing many features with the Chaucer Schaffmacher of the time, but also mapping on his own on his own, own mode against Pisan, Cortona, and Vescon, and bringing a personal and original mapping for all the regions out of the Mediterranean area. area. And to note also, he has enforced the mark of the unnamed river clearly to show the, its importance as the link between Baltic and Black Sea as a synthetic river and not a real one. You may also see the fact already explained. If the chart marker had correctly oriented the coast from Friesland to the east, his drawing would have bumped on the north of the Adriatic near Venice and then would have made Central Europa disappearing. Hence, his solutions a schematic, a schematic drawing toward to the north and a reduction of scale by half. 
So we may not, or also we may not, the figure shows in light blue, the cost directly surveyed in good orientation. In green, the cost drawn from oral anxiety data and oriented towards the north. In hard blue, the schematized cost in good orientation, but not kept by your sharp, by your sharp, sharp marker due to its impossibility. To conclude, an exceptional chart revealing of the mastery of its auto who probably had carried out a command for Ligurian merchant who wished to know with the map, the routes followed by the goods he made trade from Rouge and London with Anseatic ships, the Cog, by the Baltic and Gotland up to the Black Sea. Also a professional chart marker, well aware of the knowledge of his time, speaking in a common form for the Mediterranean, but using his own sources for his innovative mapping of Atlantic and Northern regions. 10 years before the first work of Pietro Vescon, probably the Ricardiana. A chart, perhaps secret, I tried to faire parler, but which is, still keeps some enigmas. The flower with 24 petals, I have thought to be a navigational clock 24 days from Rouge to Gotland, an hypothesis, of course. The ectasness of the drawing of Gotland, a direct source of sketch by a Mediterranean mariner or merchant who could have stayed here, but an hypothesis also. The sign in red in the scale circle, Prague, Bohemian quadrilateral, the double toponym, one in red of paradise in England, a true mystery. The writings are well undeciphered in the corner down of the chart, orders, signature. The chart in bad state, not spectacular, trimmed at the west, its eastern part lost. The, the chart, as a video chart, is nevertheless very rich of information and of a great interest for the study of the first nautical chart in the formative period especially for the knowledge of the extra Mediterranean regions, just after Pisan and Cortona and long before Carignano and Dulcia. In fact, a major stage in their history. It testifies with the mapping of Northern region at the dawn of the 14th century to the reality of a deep knowledge and a true cartographical technology mastery, proving the capacity of a chart marker of the time to mettre en carte data directly obtained from wind direction and distances by sailors, as well from second hand and oral reports, evidently on an approximate and schematized form. Here we are, here the anonymous, with the anonymous author of the chart, few later with Pietro Vescon. But the chart also shows the, lim shows the limit of its reading with the aspects we are always unable to understand. Perhaps the chart marker had placed some explanation in the missing part of his chart, and that would have given answer for questions remaining. And of course, we may hope and dream, if we prefer, to discover someday the easternmost part of the chart. But unfortunately, many hours spent in the archives of the clues does not bring anything. So we must content with the fragment came up to us. I tried first to read correctly, to read it correctly when it was possible. Second, to make talk when things were not clear, using on the basis of its contents up to with a certainly certain audacity to put my feet in those of the author to try to understand the cartographical processes. And with the help of all historical knowledge and context, which could enforce and permit my views, I hope them convincing, even if they are certainly always questionable. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Very good. Um, uh, Paul Hughes, you have a question if you can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much, Jack. That was uh, really interesting. 
Can you tell me, particularly with the earliness and the fact that you showed a sperm point to be clearly drawn, would uh, this Avignon chart have any relationship, particularly with its toponyms, with the Devise Maris that uh, Patrick Gautier Dalche uh, wrote about recently? Yes, I know the work of Godi, Patrick Gauthier Dalche, but uh, there is no help for me because it was uh, the Toile de Fond of uh, the medieval time and uh, uh, history of cartography. But uh, my work is uh, original. Fine, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, Greg, there's a question at the chat box. Uh, oh. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it. Can you read it to us, please? Uh, Byzantina says what term was used by Anna Komne for the map. This is uh, your previous to... speaker. <laughs> That's previous, yeah, the question is directed to the previous uh, speaker, Andrew Blackler. I, I can't, I can't answer, answer because uh, uh, Anna Komne was a uh, in the Byzantine, Byzantine uh, part of the, of the chart, <laughs> and there is only a Western part. Yeah, a Andrew Blackler, are you available? I see that you're uh, muted and no video. Okay, well, uh, Anne, I'm sorry, we cannot answer that question. The best, the, the best is to, to see my, my book, of course, if you are interested by it. <laughs> and I may send it to the world, will ask for me. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Well, if there's uh, no more questions, uh, I do want to comment that I find it very interesting that many features on that Avignon chart are, uh, how shall I say it, they're not what we normally think of as a map being a pictorial representation of geography, but rather uh, there's deformations and changes in scale and orientation and combining rivers together. And it's, it's operating more as a tool or a nomograph. And, uh, and as you say, it, and it, it seems that it may not even be so much for navigation as it is to provide a, a information to a, to a merchant, as you suggest. I find that very interesting. Uh, okay, our next speaker. Yeah, are there any more questions? No. Our next speaker is uh, 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 Joaquim Gaspar, who is the re uh, retired Portuguese naval officer and the principal investigator of the Media Chart Project, researching the origin, evolution, and use of nautical charts during the Middle Ages and the early modern period. And he has uh, published several articles and made presentations on. Uh, on this topic. And tonight, uh, today, Dr. Gaspar uh, will, for us, characterize the present state of knowledge relating to the genesis of nautical cartography. Joki, it's yours. Okay, uh, Greg, thank you very much for your, for your introduction. Uh, before I start, I would like to, com to compliment Andrew Blackler for his paper. Uh, I did not the time to uh, to make my company uh, after the presentation, but I very much agree with, with some uh, of your conclusions, and uh, that will be noticed in in my own presentation, uh, which I will now begin. Okay, can you see it? I hope so. Yeah. Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah. You're okay. Okay. About two years ago, an informal discussion was held among among some colleagues about the origin of nautical cartography and some related subjects. 
A valuable outcome of, the, of that discussion was the realization that there is now a broad consensus, that is my interpretation, over some critical questions which seem still shrouded by well, or should I say, a sick mist some 30 years ago uh, when the chapter of the uh, of the history of cartography on medieval Portland chart was published. The main reason for this consensus was the significant progress made in the last years uh, that was triggered in particular by the re rediscovery of the medieval manuscript Liber de Existencia Riveriana. The emergence of geomagnetic models capable of estimating magnetic declination in ancient times, the development of new cartomatic and modeling tools, and also a deeper look into the navigational content of the charts. These developments have contributed to the clarification of some important subjects, such as the purpose of the earliest Portland charts and the intimate connection between charts and navigation. The purpose of my paper is to contribute to characterize the present state of knowledge about the birth of nautical cartography by identifying relevant historiographical questions and evaluating both the proposed answers produced so far and the degree of consensus they have gathered. My presentation has two parts. In the first, I will identify those matters about which a clear consensus has emerged in the slide in the last years, and in the second, some of the points of disagreement among scholars will be addressed. These are the six points I have decided to include in the first group, although I am well aware that not all of them may raise unanimous agreement. Let me introduce and briefly discuss each of them. The first, nautical charts and marine navigation are intimately connected from the very beginning of nautical cartography. This conclusion, which may look like a, a tautology, a trivial truth, is now shared by the vast majority of historians. In fact, the naviga navigational purpose of the earliest Portland charts is confirmed, for example, by the presence of compass cross directions, the depiction of a distant scale and the representation of navigational hazards. The obvious implication is that any attempt to understand how these charts were made and used must consider the fact that they were conceived as instruments for navigation and constructed with navigational data. These facts do not imply, however, that is an important point, that charts were made and used for navigation only, and that pilots always use them at sea. Second point, Portland charts were constructed with navigational data consisting in compass directions and estimated distances. No medieval text was short, uh, source is extant describing how Portland charts were made. The use of compass directions and distances is referred to in Iberian navigational treatises of the 16th century as the way to add new places to a chart. It is also mentioned by the mathematician Pedro Nunes as the method used to construct the traditional charts of the Mediterranean. Compass directions and estimated distance were the two primary navigational elements of information used to fix the ship position at sea before the introduction of astronomical methods. I have demonstrated in previous works that the use of a sample of pelagic tracks connected points in the Mediterranean, each defined by a compass direction and a distance, under the influence of magnetic declination, produce a cartographic representation whose gross geometric features closely match those of Portland charts. Third point, the prototype from which all extant Portland charts derived was constructed around the beginning of the 17th century. 
we do know that the average value of magnetic declination in the central and western Mediterranean in the period 1200 to 1250, as estimated by a modern geomagnetic model, approximately matches the average tilt of the shafts up to the end of the 16th century. In this graph here, you have the time, here you have tilt, this is degrees, this represents the, the secular variation of magnetic declination, and these points are the average tilts of a series of charts. Okay, this is an indication that the earlier charts were probably constructed in that period, that is between 1200 and 1250, and that they were not correct is for the secular variation of magnetic declination during the almost four centuries that followed. This is coherent with the fact that marine compasses were indeed used on board ships in the last decades of the 12th century. Many historians now consider that the Compasso de Navigare of about 1250, the second oldest known portal one, because the first is in the liver, was compiled with information scaled off from a chart. That was the subject of Raul Nicolai's paper in Lisbon two years ago. Thus, charts based on compact directions already existed by that date. Fourth point, a primitive type of nautical chart based on astronomical directions may have existed before the model of the Carpizan, which is based on compass directions. Some of the descriptions in the Liber de Existencia Riveriada strongly suggest that the author was reading and taking measurements from some type of map with a scale bar and a wind road system rather than reproducing information provided by mariners. This interpretation is reinforced by the fact that some of the routes listed in the manuscripts do not have navigational interests are contrary to the prevailing winds and sometimes intercept dry land. Preceding the prologue of the manuscript, a description of the Mediterranean is made in the form of an ordered sequence of tracks connecting pairs of coastal places. There are two types, those going around the coast contact blockwise, starting and ending in the Strait of Gibraltar, for which only distances are given. Those are the black lines in the picture, and those connecting places across the open sea, for which directions, directions are also provided. Those are the red and the yellow lines. A very important detail is that these last directions are not, I repeat, are not affected by magnetic declination, which indicate that they were not measured with a marine compass. Fifth point, from about 1200 onwards, compass directions were collected by mariners, gradually replacing astronomical directions in both navigation and the construction of charts. By the time the Compasso de Navigare was written, the process was completed. Well, the Liber de Existencia Riveriarum contains both astronomical and magnetic directions. Uh, in the body of the text, this picture illustrates the tracks in the body of the text for which directions are provided. By the time the manuscript was made, Primitive marine compasses were already in use on board ships, although only as an alternative to the traditional astronomical methods of direction finding. As marine compasses improved, astronomical methods seem to have lost much of its centrality in navigation. That is demonstrated by the fact that all directions in the compass de navigare seem to be magnetic. The same happens with the earliest known Portland chart, the Carpizan. Last point, sixth point. You know, extant Portland charts, especially in the older ones, there are recognizable differences of scale, 
orientation and accuracy in the representation of the various regions. This indicates the use of multiple sources of cartographic information and further suggests that the earliest charts may have been made as piecewise construction of regional representations. This is the geographical grid which is implicit in the chart of Mecha de Villadestes of 1413. Notice how meridians and parallels are deformed here in the vicinity of this vertical line as if two different representations were stitched together, one of the Western Mediterranean and the other of the Eastern Mediterranean and Black Sea. The same feature is also perceived in this graph, which illustrates the variation of the apparent latitude errors with longitude, that is, across uh, the Mediterranean. Here, the inclination of the clusters is proportional to the tilt of the representation in the various regions as a result of magnetic declination. Notice how the data are grouped in three clearly defined clusters, one for the Atlantic with a clockwise tilt and the last dispersion indicating poor accuracy, the Western Mediterranean and the Eastern Mediterranean and Black Sea both with a counterclockwise tilt. The boundary between these two last groups at about longitude 20 degrees east here is the same as in the geographical grid we have seen before. In this other graph, which illustrates regional variation of scale, not tilt, the same discontinuity between the two regions is clear. Here, the scale in the Eastern Mediterranean and Black Sea with the positive slope of the regression line is larger than in the Western Mediterranean, which has a negative slope. Smaller scale, larger scale. While it seems unquestionable that each of these groups correspond to a different source, it is still uncertain whether those sources consisted in regional charts, as suggested by many authors since Nordetsky, or just in different sets of data used in the compilation of a general chart. Anyway, the occurrence of these variations in tilt, scale and accuracy seems to exclude the possibility that, that the making of the earlier chart of the old Mediterranean was preceded by a general survey where common measuring standards for distances and directions were adopted. These were the points about which there seems to be some consensus among historians. Browsing through the discussion of the last year, I have realized that the disagreements in our small group are relatively minor and don't address, in my opinion, critical matters. Having arrived at the important consensus that the earlier charts were made for navigation and constructed using navigational data, some points still need clarification. For lack of time, I will only address three of them. First one, how was the navigational information used to make the earlier charts stored? By navigational information, I mean the specific elements needed to construct a chart, namely the courses and distances between the ports, the location of navigational hazard, the place names, etc. There are three possible ways, most probably coexisting in the Middle Ages, that could be used to store that information. The pilot's memories, the pilot's notes, and cartographic, cartographical sketches. The use of mental maps by Pellets, which is championed by Tony Campbell, makes all sense in coastal navigation and piloting, where the reconstruction of a route by a pilot can be based on the memorized images of conspicuous features on land, mountains, capes, alignments, etc., complemented with names, courses, depths, travel times, etc. 
However, this method is not suitable for navigation in non-coastal waters, where visual features are scarce or even non-existent. In my opinion, the most effective way for a pilot to store detailed information about oceanic routes is, first, to write them down as important, and second, to make an annotated sketch as in charts. These records could then be used to construct a chart, even though that was not necessarily their initial purpose. Second point, how was the earlier chart of the old Mediterranean made? The very existence of the medieval Portland chart covering from the Atlantic coast of Europe and Northwest Africa to the Black Sea demonstrates that the information necessary to its construction was collected, accumulated, circulated, and became available to those interested in its making. I'm referring not only to the, to the navigational information produced by mariners, that is, sketches, notes, lists of routes and place names, but also to the one provided by travelers, merchants, scholars, and local officials. The fact that the oldest excellent Portland charts are already fully fledged representations showing a high degree of accuracy and details indicates that the long development process must have taken place and that at some time, some form of centralized organization had to be created. In other words, in other words, that a planned project was carried out by an unidentified individual or group of people, probably of Italian origin. By that time, local chart of various regions created independently, most probably it existed already. I assume here, and this is a personal interpretation, that the first chart of the old Mediterranean was built by assembling an uncertain number of those regional representation. This was a critical process, especially if no substantial overlap existed between them and their scales and orientations were slightly different. We do know that the process was not perfect because the different regions can still be identified in the extant charts through their scale and orientation variation. Third and last, was the shape of the Mediterranean known before the first shots were drawn. Let me have some water, sorry. Okay, this final point remains to be discussed, which is whether the construction of the earliest nautical shots relies or not on previous knowledge about the overall shape of the Mediterranean Sea. I have taken good note of the objections raised in our group, most especially of the fact that the obvious candidate to such a role, the maps in Ali Dries's Tabla Rogeriana of the middle of the 12th century are very inaccurate when compared with the Carte Pisan. But the question is not whether the shape of the Mediterranean was known before the first nautical charts were created, we have indeed historical evidence from the antiquity that it was, but if such a knowledge was shared by pilots and shark makers. Moreover, hundreds of years navigating in the Mediterranean Sea must have produced considerable, considerable knowledge about its geography, which accumulated and circulated. That information was certainly useful long before the Caspisan to the creators of the proto-nautical chart implied in the text and data of the Lingua de Existencia Riveriana. As a mariner, I find it difficult to imagine how such a knowledge could reside for centuries only in the pilot's memories and written texts, where the object being described was geographical and the failure to recall and interpret correctly, correctly complex navigational information might have disastrous consequences. A much more effective way of recording 
Recalling and transmitting such information would be a cartographic representation, however crude it might be. That is why I believe that maps of the Mediterranean and navigational sketches circulated among mariners much before, perhaps centuries, a fully fledged nautical chart was created. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joki. Thank you very much for that. And um, okay, do we have any questions? Time. Do we have any uh, questions at all? Uh, Luis, I see you have your hand. You have to unmute. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joaquim, for, for this talk. And that sums up so many things that we've been discussing uh, these years. Um, I had more, more a comment than a question on, on the final, one of the final points about how information was gathered and transmitted. And I don't know how it was done for nautical charts, of course, but I think there is uh, uh, something that we could look at as a possible example for comparison, which is how the information about coordinates was transmitted in the Middle Ages. And I'm thinking of the, these catalogs of coordinates that one finds in Arab texts, mainly devoted to other ends for astronomical or religious purposes. But there you have lists of numbers and cities that are uh, transcribed. And what one sees is that very often uh, errors are introduced in copying and over time they get corrupted because it's very difficult to make sense of the whole of that list. And so you don't know if, if a city that is given Venice is given a, a longitude of 17. You don't know if it's wrong or correct because there is no way of knowing. You, you would need to actually draw a map to, act, to actually see if that longitude makes sense or not. So I'm thinking that if, I, I tend to agree with you that if information was gathered only numerically or, or written without any graphic substrate, graphic transcription, some, some graphic form, I think it would have been difficult for it to survive without corrupting. So that tends to support, uh, I think, your, your idea that there must be some graphic form that has not been preserved, but that there must have been some graphic form. That was my, my comment. Okay. Thank you very much. In a way, you have summarized what, what I have said. Indeed, uh, I do believe that there were written texts uh, we have the parable, of course, of the Roman times and before the Roman times, which is a tradition of writing uh, on paper the navigational information. And I don't think that such a tradition was lost during the Middle Ages. So I do believe that the information necessary to make a chart was preserved in two ways, by sketches or proto charts and by writing lists of names, lists of directions, etc. Thank you, Luis. Uh, Tony, if you can unmute yourself, please. And I, we, we can't see you, Tony. We don't have the, the image. Oh, hang on. Start video. Very good. All right, sorry. Uh, but, uh, uh, a very good uh, a summary, uh, Joachim. Um, uh, I think I think you know, I agree with a lot of it. Um, but uh, those who either have or perhaps will come, uh, sort of uh, be prepared to, to at least at least uh, dip into my very long uh, essay, um, you will see there that, that I have taken very different views uh, approach to it. Um, just one or two points are. Uh, the, the the idea of a mental map, which and when I first mentioned that some years back, I think perhaps the first uh, of these um, workshops was thought to be you know somewhat outrageous. But I think uh, that I that sense that actually that, that, that people have come round to the notion, and, and I have shown uh, examples of, of mental maps of, of from other parts of the world and so on. And I think possibly Shima is going to be talking about that as well. The capacity of the human um, mind to, to, to have a complete, pretty accurate map of the Mediterranean, I think is really not particularly difficult, particularly from somebody who didn't do much else. I mean, a pilot, that's, 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 that's the whole thing he has to learn. He doesn't have to read books. Um, I also uh, would, would ask those who assume that there has to be some literature, um, some textual 
um, antecedent in all this to come up with the not just the evidence, but but also come up with the, with the reason why that makes any sense. I actually think, and I mean, I argue that the Kapisan represents a, a, a chart made for illiterate sailors. Um, literacy at that time is, is, is hardly something which you would have needed in an artisanal um, context. You would only expect to have um, you know, builders and goldsmiths and all the rest of it, um, you know, writing and so on. No, it's, and, and also orality. Um, you can't understand the chart, can't use it, um, the chart design. There is no instructions on it. The writing is only to toponymy. No, there's nothing to explain, explain to you what these um, navigational markings mean and so on. So uh, I would have just hope perhaps that, that, that um, uh, as I said, it's freely available on my website, the Map History website. I do hope that perhaps people would dip into it. I think there's a, a table of contents and you can, I'm, I've, I've, I've I have touched on and indeed gone into some detail on, on, on many of these points. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sai, for, for your summary. Of course, you do agree that the, the, the points of disagreement are, are small, are not small, and not that critical. Uh, you do agree with that. Uh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure I do, but, but, but <laughs> maybe, I think it may be for others to decide whether... Okay, yes, you are right, you are quite right. My suggestion that, that in fact, uh, for example, uh, I, my assertion is that nobody would ever have sailed uh, across the uh, Mediterranean out of sight of land without having a mental map. Uh, I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. It would be suicidal, and and therefore, from from time immemorial, people uh, you know had to have that 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 knowledge in their head. Um, so, uh, and therefore, I think that that in fact that the, the the map that was the, the first downloaded, as it were, in some way, uh, in a graphic form, I think it looked probably very much like the carte Vizan, um, rather cruder and needing to be um, re reconciled because there will be all, all sorts of things that are wrong. But basically, I think it looked like that. Now, I'm not sure that that is not quite a long way away from what you're saying. <laughs> Uh, we're about to, we're just about on schedule here, and I would like to add that uh, although there may be some differences between the, uh, uh, the points of view of these two gentlemen, within the, the history of cartography since the time of uh, Santorum and Joe Mard and, and Nordenshield, uh, we have come, we have indeed come a lot closer in our uh, opinions about the uh, origins of the uh, Portland chart. So um, gradually reducing the number of differences over time. So uh, it's exact, my clock says exactly 3.30 and you're welcome to go and explore the breakout rooms and we will return here in uh, 30 minutes.